Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. How many are glad they're here tonight? Amen. Amen. There's at least three of us that are glad we're here. <laughs> I hope everyone's glad. All right, there are four. Uh, do we have five? No. Anyway, let's all stand together and uh, take your hymnals. Turn to hymn 361, When I See the Blood. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth. And hopefully before you go, you'll be glad that you came tonight. Amen. 361. Let's all stand again. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Number two, chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save. All he has promised, that will he do. Wash in the fountain, open for sin, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Number four. O oh, great compassion, O oh, boundless love, O oh, loving kindness, faithful and true, find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen, amen. Well, good to have all of you here tonight. I hope you're doing well. hope you're having a good week. And I'm glad that it stopped raining long enough for you to get here and get in the building. I was uh, coming uh, down Route 8, and it was just pounding my car in rain. And, and I got here, and it led up just long enough for me to run in the building. And I was praying it would stop raining so you all didn't get wet. And, uh, and it looks like that that worked out. So, um, but uh, thankful for the showers outside. And listen, uh, have, how many of you have ever been to a desert area? Raise your hand if you've ever been to a desert area. I got to say, I'm thankful for the rain because I like my front lawn being green, not brown. Amen. And so I'm not complaining about the rain one bit. And I'm thankful for it. And, uh, and we got to have it so things stay green. But um, I'm thankful for rain not only in and uh, outside, but I'm thankful for rainstorms in my own life because that's when I grow the most is when God sends the rain. So uh, just that thought there. We'll uh, shake each other's hands, greet one another in the Lord. We'll come back and sing that chorus in just a moment. Let's pick that up on the chorus again. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen, amen. So thankful tonight for uh, all of you and a chance to be in God's house. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to meet with us tonight and be here in our presence. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace, your goodness in our lives, and God, just the showers of blessings you dump on us daily. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight uh, as we endeavor to seek your face through prayer. And Lord, we're thankful that your word has told us that there's only one mediator between uh, God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, in a few minutes, we'll take our petitions 
straight to you, uh, we'll come boldly before the throne of grace as you commanded us in Hebrews. And Lord, I pray that as we take several minutes to pray and bring the needs of those that are uh, directly associated with the church and then, Lord, loved ones and friends of those that are associated with the church, I pray, Lord, you'd hear our prayers. And Lord, that uh, you'd see the, the hearts uh, of those praying and God, you'd answer those prayers. And God, I have to pray when we get to the Bible study that you'd help us to uh, have uh, discerning hearts, listening ears, and Lord, may we gather a lot from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. If you need a prayer request slip, if you'd hold up an empty hand and one of our ushers can get you a prayer request slip. If you have a prayer request slip that's been completed, if you'd hold that up and uh, one of our ushers will collect that from you. And if you want to keep the prayer request between you and I, fold it in half. If you want it read in the service here, then leave it unfolded. Uh, while those are being done, please pray for my daughter, April. Um, April went to the emergency room Tuesday, or Monday evening, rather, with some pretty severe stomach pain. We were there from, all four of us were there from about 11 o'clock at night until, oh, I guess we got out of there about 5 in the morning. And so uh, they did some blood work on her. They did uh, some other tests. And she, she's been dealing with stomach uh, pain for about a month. And we've been to a couple of different doctors to see what's going on. And uh, they think they got it under control. They got her on, on, on some new medicine. And she's not uh, here tonight. Angela's not here tonight. They're home uh, uh, with April recovering. So if you can, uh, in your prayers, th think about and pray for, uh, pray for April. Uh, they're my daughter. All right. Any other prayer request slips that are in the middle of being filled out? Miss Jamie's working on one. Any, any others? All right. If one of you men could could uh, collect that from her as soon as she's done with it. Brother John Segru, if you would come and, uh, and lead us in the prayer portion of our service. <clears throat> Good evening. Okay, I have a couple of prayer requests here. Uh, this one's from uh, Jason and Janice. Uh, please pray for our mother, um, Antoinette, is that how I believe it's pronounced, uh, to heal. Uh, she will be 95 years uh, old on August 8th. Okay. And then also I have one from Marcia regarding uh, Ron uh, for God's will. Also for Marcia for pure heart, holiness, obedience, and revival. And uh, also for lost loved ones as well as for her mother for her continued health. And then I have one other one here from Jamie. Uh, please pray for um, Saturday. We're, uh, we're going to uh, New York City to um, preach the gospel. Okay. Um, who's this? Tim Batches? Beto, Tim Beto's family. Uh, I'm not sure if I can read that word. What follows? Oh. Okay, for a brother, Tim Beto's brother passed away. Okay, all right, we'll pray for these. And then I'll mention a few others uh, in, during our prayer. And I'm going to pray also, just to let you know, on the salvation side, and Brother Mike is going to come up and help me with the medical needs. So any men uh, would like to come up and uh, kneel at the altar, you're certainly welcome to uh, come up now at this point. And then we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time of prayer. And uh, Lord, it's good to be in your house this evening. Uh, Lord, I'm, I would attest to the fact that, uh, you know, there, there, there is always a battle between the spirit and the flesh. And uh, Lord, I'm just glad to, to be here in your house. Uh, Lord, I pray and hope that the, uh, that, that the spirit certainly wins the battle. And uh, Lord, I look forward to the hearing, uh, the preaching of the, of the Word of God this evening. I pray that it would uh, stir my heart in some way. And I pray uh, likewise for uh, all the folks here that uh, the Holy Spirit of God would stir each one of our hearts as we hear the Word of God preached. Uh, now, Lord, we do pray for these particular needs. We do, we, we do lift up April, uh, Pastor Lejeune's uh, daughter, uh, as she's been uh, dealing with a severe stomach ache, um, probably very severe this last couple days ago, but for the past month. And uh, Lord, we do pray that you've uh, give the doctors wisdom uh, to be able to deal with uh, what type of medication she would need and pray that she, the new medication that she's on uh, would certainly help. And Lord, I pray that they would be able to uh, evaluate and get this under control. And then Lord, we also pray for, um, for Mike Varro. I lift him up before you as he uh, continues uh, with this stealth stem therapy that you guide him and direct him and give the doctors wisdom. And uh, we also pray for uh, Brother Mike Scarpetti uh, to give him a, a continued recovery with his uh, legs and his back and what have you. Uh, give him strength and guide him and protect him. 
And then, Lord, we also lift up uh, Ed Cowan as he's uh, uh, undergoing um, this ALS. Uh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just comfort him and give him peace. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, actually intervene and, uh, and heal him. Um, Lord, that would be your, your will if, if it would be done. But, uh, Lord, we do pray you'd give him grace during this time. And then also we lift up, um, as uh, Jamie's asked for uh, a prayer for um, uh, Saturday as they go to New York to preach the gospel, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide Jamie and, and the folks that go, that you'd uh, put a hedge of protection around them and keep them safe. I pray that you'd uh, give them boldness and power and protection as a uh, <clears throat> witness for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that uh, souls would uh, actually uh, trust Christ as Savior as, as this effort uh, goes out. And then, Lord, we also pray for um, Tim Beto's uh, family, who uh, I believe uh, lost a brother uh, just two days ago. So we, we ask, Lord, that you would comfort the family and uh, give them strength during this difficult time. And, Lord, just uh, watch over them and, and give them comfort and peace, to, Lord. And then also we pray for Marcia's uh, request for Ron, for God's will to be done there, as well as for Marcia, uh, for her to have a pure heart and holiness and obedience and revival. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd keep her close to you. And, uh, Lord, help guide her and direct her and help her in these areas of her life. And then, Lord, we also ask for, uh, for her loved ones that are lost, that you would do a work there and uh, save souls. And uh, you just prick their hearts as they, they need to be, uh, especially those who need to trust Christ as Savior, especially those who maybe don't have a, an open ear. But, Lord, I pray that you would give them an open ear. Open ear and uh, have them, give them the opportunity to trust Christ as Savior. And then also we pray for her mother, uh, that you give her continued health, that you guide her and protect her and keep her strong, keep her protected, and uh, just watch over her, Lord. And then also, Lord, we pray for uh, Jason and Janice. I've asked for um, a prayer, prayer for um, their mother, Antoinette, uh, for, for, her, for healing. And I believe uh, she'll be 95 years of, years of age coming soon on August 8th. But I do, Lord, do ask, Lord, that you would watch over her and uh, touch her body and heal her and give her strength and uh, guide her and protect her. Now, Lord, on the um, salvation side of our bulletin, Lord, there's many folks we, we have listed here, but just for a few, we'll lift them up. Uh, Vinny, <clears throat> I believe that's Vinny Urbano, which, uh, we ask for Judy Barrett, as well as for Richard, as well as uh, we ask for Freddie's mom, and also for Diane Vara, for uh, Chris Dannon who has cancer and needs salvation. Now, Lord, these names we lift up before you, and, and uh, Lord, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to lift them up in prayer. We pray, Lord, that, you're, that you would guide them and direct them, and, and Lord, bring the, uh, the situation about in each one of their lives where they would see and, and understand uh, the gospel, and they would have opportunity, and I pray that they would be re receptive to that opportunity to trust Christ. And then, Lord, we also pray for um, some of our government leaders, uh, uh, Governor Malloy, as well as uh, for Mayor Hawkins right here, Harkins rather, right here in Stratford. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, watch over these men and their families. And, Lord, we pray really for all of our government officials that you would uh, work in each one of their lives and their hearts. Pray, Lord, that each one would do your will. And, uh, Lord, and uh, each one would... Uh, would come to a, a saving grace of Jesus Christ, that they would trust Christ as Savior. And then, Lord, we also lift up our men and women in the service. And I do pray uh, sp specifically for Andrew Brown, uh, Pastor Brown's uh, grandson, who's in the Army. We do lift him up before you. We ask that you uh, guide him and protect him and put a hedge of protection around him. And uh, just keep him faithful, Lord, and uh, keep him protected. And, uh, Lord, may he be a, a witness uh, to those that are around him in the service. And, Lord, I just pray that you'd guide and protect them all. Now, Lord, we do thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord, we know you're, you're the great physician. And um, I lift up really everybody on this list. We seem to have a lot of health needs in the church. But uh, specifically, I just want to lift up a few we pray for cindy roan's father who had a stroke lord we pray that uh, there won't be any lasting problems that you restore his health we pray for jackie with a pneumonia uh it's been on the list a couple of day a couple of weeks now I, I pray you'd help her as she's struggling through that please restore her health 
We pray for Sue B., uh, who's been, had issues for a long time. I pray you'd come for her and give her healing. I pray, God, that uh, uh, you'd comfort her heart as well. We pray for Trina Bish. I'm not sure what treatment she's going through now, but uh, I pray that you give the doctors wisdom and give her guidance, Lord. I pray you would restore her health and I just uh, give her the grace she needs, God. We pray for Swanti, Swanti Linquist in Jamaica. Help him, please, with his ministry. I remember when he was here years ago, uh, he was a blessing, and I pray you'd help him in his efforts to reach the lost, put a hedge of protection about him. I pray for Rose uh, for her housing. I'm not uh, aware of the whole situation, but I pray that you meet her needs, Lord, and help her uh, to have good, solid housing and a stable environment. We pray for uh, Brother Kyle's sister, Hayden. And I'm not sure what decisions she needs to make, but I pray you give her guidance, Lord, and give her your spirit. Help her to make the right decisions and give her peace about it. We pray for uh, Sean, who's at uh, the RU home in South Carolina. Help him. I pray, God, that you give him the grace that he needs and help him uh, with any hurdles that are in the way. We pray for Zany Peck, uh, one of our shut-ins. We pray you give her peace and comfort. And we pray for Autumn Graham. I know um, there was some decisions that they were going to make. I pray you help her and uh, help her with uh, her schools and her studies. We ask that you bless the service tonight, Lord, and bless the teaching. Help us to be receptive, Lord, for what you, what, for the lesson that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand again and take our hymnals and turn to hymn 393, Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the first and the last. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Number three. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. You can be seated. Before our ushers come, before they come, we'll look at our missionary letter for tonight. This is from the Kamilchu family. Uh, there are missionaries to Russia, and their letter says this is dated May to June 2017. Our city is not exempt from this. Fifteen people were killed in an explosion on a metro train in our city, St. Petersburg. I, uh, Constantine, was in the, that very spot just 10 minutes earlier. After arriving at my destination and taking the escalator up from underground, the announcement was made that the entire metro system uh, in the city was being evacuated and shut down. The Russian Anti-Terrorism Committee found and deactivated a bomb at another St. Petersburg subway station simultaneously. The old population of the city 
realized how fragile life is, many were selflessly helping each other. Since the main means of transportation was closed, people walked through the city to get home. Those who had cars were picking up pedestrians to get them to their homes free of charge. Others were offering free bottled water to those who walked through the city, yet others were offering snacks on street corners. It is amazing how tragedy can soften people's hearts and make them more humane. After the attack, we continue seeking to comfort and present the gospel to the relatives of the killed and injured victims. Counseling, on a, of a, um, counseling of a young couple, Mr. and Mrs., and just use the first letter of the last name, S. Mr. and Mrs. S., a young family, have a difficult background. Mr. S. is a fruit of the 90s, quote-unquote, revival in Russia, when, according to the report of only one de uh, denomination, the whole Russian population was saved three times over, if we had all the reports that came to the U.S. between 1990 and 2000, the whole Russian population was saved at least five times. Yet, yes, he had a profession of faith, em embracement by believers, yet no regenerate heart. Mrs. S. is from a char charismatic home and, um, and charisma charismatic uh, nurturing. She first invited the young Mr. S. to her youth group, then eventually into her personal life. By his heavenly arrangement, God allowed uh, our way to cross in the city. At about the same time, the young family had a baby born. Struggles within the marriage and conflict with both sets of parents began to escalate, which triggered their search for counseling. By God's grace, we meet almost weekly, and we see how God's word is working in their hearts. Mr. S. is now reading the word, and we believe that the Lord will accomplish what he has begun in them. A joyful addition, another young couple, Mr. and Mrs. P., just had a miracle baby. The Lord answered multiple prayers of the church family on behalf of the mother and the baby. Doctors had said that the baby would be born with some deformities, and the mother might not survive the delivery. Yet God gave the mother strength and health to deliver with almost no complications and blessed the couple with a healthy baby. We encouraged our young congregation by personal example to care for the couple who just had, uh, had the baby. We brought warm meals to the family for more than a week to encourage and support them during the mother's recovery. Rejoice with us uh, over opportunities to see the, uh, the families of the victims of the Metro attack, or to serve rather, opportunities to serve the families of the victims of the Metro attack, and then the birth of a healthy baby, and then pray with us for Mr. and Mrs. S to dedicate their hearts to the Lord and for peace with both sets of parents, and then for boldness in witnessing regardless of the prohibitions here in Russia. Sincerely in him, the Kamilchu family. So. Uh, we'll pray for them in just a moment. Ushers, you can go ahead and come forward. Prepare to collect this evening's tithes, offerings, and faith promise giving. Make sure you're faithful to the Lord to give as he is abundantly given to you and to I. And we will pray for the Camilchu family and for the offering. Brother Sanchez, if you would pray for this uh, family and then uh, pray that God blesses our rest of our service.
right, let's take our hymnals again and turn to hymn 310, Room at the Cross. We'll do the first and the last. First and the last. upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and its grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Number three. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. All right. Proverbs chapter 1 in your Bibles this evening. Proverbs chapter 1. We are marching through the Bible book by book, spending about a week on each book. And it has been a very um, enjoyable study for me as I've prepared these. Um, and I hope that if, uh, something that's been said throughout the series has, has been a blessing to you, to those that have been here. Um, I will say this, as much as I enjoy preaching sermons and doing, teaching the Bible study, the preparation for the sermon is more enjoyable than the preaching of the sermon. Um, there is just something extra special about sitting alone with your Bible and just digging deep and mining away and finding a truth. And if... Um, if you've been saved a good long time and you've gone to church a good long time, at some point you're going to have to start doing some of that for yourself. Get in the book and study it and, uh, and uncover truths for yourself and, and feed yourself spiritually. I, I liken it to, to babies. Um, uh, babies need a parent or an adult to uh, you know, spoon the food in their mouth. And that's a messy proposition, isn't it? How many of you have little ones that you are feeding or can remember back to a day where you fed little ones and it's just, you know, there's almost more food on the face than there is in the mouth and uh, there's some of that here as I'm feeding, spooning out the Word of God, you're not always going to get everything that's, that's taught, uh, but hopefully you grow and you grow to a place where you can start feeding yourself. That's the idea, so I'd encourage you really to get in the Word of God and study it every day, read it, understand it. And, uh, and, and grow by it. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word tonight, Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to look at the first six verses, and then uh, from there that will launch us into a study of uh, the book of Proverbs tonight. Verse 1, the Bible says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel, to understand a proverb in the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Tonight we're going to look at this topic of getting and giving wisdom. Getting and giving wisdom. Let's pray. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us as we look at this book and God, what a treasure trove, what a gift right in the center of our Bibles that we can refer to, that we can look at. Uh, God, to help guide us through some of the most delicate times in life, some of the most difficult situations. And God, we have a book that's just filled with so much wisdom that uh, comes right from heaven. 
And God, um, as we ask for wisdom to get us through situations, we're thankful that we have a book um, within the Bible that we can turn to to help us. And so tonight, I pray you'd help us to understand the book a little bit better, a little bit deeper. And Lord, may our appreciation of it be greater. And Lord, may we leave here with a determination to not only get wisdom for ourselves, but Lord, to teach it to the next generation. And God, in uh, the next 50, 75 years, uh, it will be the next generation, children that aren't even born yet, that will be running uh, this world. And so, God, I pray we'd make it our mission to not only get wisdom for ourselves, but, Lord, Lord, learn how to instill it in those that are coming up behind us. And so as we pay attention to that tonight, may you help us, and help, may you help us to pay attention. I know there are many people here tonight that are tired. They've worked all day. And, Lord, they're uh, physically fatigued. But, God, would you give them an extra special helping of rest and Lord, as they uh, listen tonight, restore us spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Let's jump right into the heart of the message tonight as we dive into this rich book. We're going to look at four main thoughts. And the first point here, and this is more of an introductory type point, so we'll jump right into it, is the pen of Proverbs. The pen, P-E-N, the pen of Proverbs. God wrote the entire Bible, and I know I say this a lot uh, but I don't know that it can be said too much. God wrote the entire Bible. The entire Bible was authored by God. It was not authored by men. God simply used men to put down His words on uh, paper. And so last week we looked at the book of Psalms and we talked about all the men that helped write out the book. But nonetheless, it was God that authored it. They were just His secretaries. And with Proverbs, uh, this can be a little tricky because... You look at the book of Proverbs and you think to yourself, well, Solomon was such a wise man and he gave us all this wisdom. Well, yes, Solomon did give us his wisdom and I'm sure Solomon knew a lot of the things he was pinning down, but uh, this was God writing through Solomon's hand nonetheless. And so please keep that in mind. There are three men that God used to write the book of Proverbs. Letter A, we see Solomon. If you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin there, Solomon. Solomon. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 says... The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. He pinned down 29 of the 31 uh, Proverbs there. So uh, he pinned down the first 29 chapters of Proverbs. Now, chapters 1 through 24, he left in the form of uh, what we would call a book or a scroll. And King Hezekiah, when he became king many generations later, uh, his men would uncover more uh, of the writings of Solomon. And so they would take chapters 25 through 29, and those would be added to chapters 21 through 24. But nonetheless, Solomon wrote the first 29 chapters uh, there of the book. Uh, letter B is the name Agar, Agar, A-G-U-R, Agar. He pinned down chapter 30, and letter C is the name Lemuel, or Lemuel, or however you want to pronounce it. I'm sure we're not saying it right in the, in the native tongue anyway, but uh, Lemuel, and he pinned down chapter 31. Now, uh, you may be familiar with chapter 31. Chapter 31 is the chapter about the virtuous woman. Um, uh, it's a very, very, very rich chapter. Uh, I have heard some people, by the way, we don't know who the virtuous woman was. I've heard all kinds of theories on this. I've heard that this is just uh, some uh, mystical person that's never existed, and this is what a, a perfect woman would be if, if, if she were able to achieve all these things. I don't, I don't buy that. I think this probably was describing a woman in the Bible. And uh, uh, I've heard someone hypothesize that they thought that this might have been Solomon's mother. Now, you stop thinking about who Solomon's mother was, Bathsheba. You think, could have it been Bathsheba? I mean, she was the one that had the affair with David. Uh, you know, I will say this, is that whoever this virtuous woman was, she wasn't perfect. She was a sinner. And, um, and so it, it could still have been Bathsheba. She could have found her way back from that. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, chapter 31 is a good book, and... It's um, or rather a good chapter, and, and I would encourage you to look at that and read it and study it. To the young men here who aren't married, find you a Proverbs 31 woman or woman who's working to become that. To you ladies that are here tonight, I would encourage you to strive to be that woman, uh, that, uh, that, that godly woman. Uh, so uh, that's the pen, the pen of Proverbs. Number two, notice the purpose of Proverbs. I'm going to hurry through the first couple points here. 
Um, points two and four are where we'll spend most of the time. Uh, point th ones and three we'll, go, we'll move through rather quickly. Notice letter A, uh, the, purpose, the purposes of Proverbs, letter A, to perceive accurately, to perceive accurately. Look down at Proverbs chapter one and verse number two. Bear with me tonight, I'm coming down with a pretty nasty cold and I may not have a voice when I'm done here, so just bear with me. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2. If I made the mistake of shaking your hands tonight, make sure you wash your hands before you put your fingers in your mouth. Amen? Shouldn't be doing that anyway. It says there, verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. What is the purpose of Proverbs? What, why did God give us this book? Well, He wants you and I to be able to look at a situation, and He wants us to be able to perceive that situation with understanding or with wisdom or with instruction. And so you go through life and the, the, the more of God's wisdom you get in you, the quicker and better and more accurately you are at dissecting a situation and being able to perceive it. Uh, I've used this before, but uh, early in my adult life, I heard all these quick get rich schemes. And I remember I was a poor college kid trying to pay my way through. And, uh, I, you know, I was told, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, you do this for three hours a day and you'll be a millionaire in, in, in two years. And, you know, uh, the, man, they really made that thing sound so convincing. Luckily, I didn't invest any money in it, but uh, they had me strung along there for a little bit. The, the older you get, the more you live life, the more you walk with the Lord, the more you learn His Word, the more you can begin to understand and perceive things accurately accurately. Uh, if you ever are needing godly counsel, you say, who should I go to to get counsel? You should find someone who you know walks with God and reads the Bible and go to them for counsel. Why? Because they can see things through a spiritual scope a little bit better than you can. Now, I walk with God, I read my Bible, and I pray, but I got to tell you, I've got blind spots. Everybody in here has blind spots. And so that's why the Bible tells us in, in the book of Proverbs that in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. You need to have that multitude of counselors that you're going to. But what is the purpose of the book of Proverbs to help you and I to perceive life accurately? Letter B, notice, to perfect, to perfect constantly. Look at verse 3 there with me. It says, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity. Now, you, uh, if you're just reading through the book of Proverbs, you gloss over this verse and you think, well, wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, those are all synonyms. They all mean about the same thing. And that's not the case. Each one of these words contains its own set of treasures that you can uh, pull away from, pull out of. And verse 3 says we're to receive the instruction of, of these things. Now, I wrote down some uh, synonyms of each individual word. The word wisdom, uh, uh, some synonyms for that would be discernment or foresight. Discernment or foresight. You have the discernment to know a situation. You might remember uh, when Solomon asked God for wisdom, he didn't use the word wisdom. He asked God to give him a discernment. A discerning heart. And so the ability to be able to discern and we're to learn or we're to receive the instruction from that discernment. How many times have has a person walked up to a situation and discerned it right but still went the wrong way? It happens all the time. It's not just enough to be able to discern it. You've got to receive the instruction from that discernment. That foresight, that ability to be able to see a problem coming at you really before anyone else uh, uh, does or uh, the average person would. The word justice, justice there, I wrote down these synonyms, authority and integrity. Authority and integrity. Uh, someone who lives um, justice or represents justice, those are authority figures. Those are people who wield power over us in order to help us stay in line, help us stay in line. And think of a, a parents, they will power over a child. Why? So they can abuse that power, so they can take advantage of that ch uh, uh, child, so they can uh, uh, treat that child like a slave. No, they have power over the child so they can punish the child when the child gets out of line. That parent is justice. That parent is 
authority, but that authority only works if that authority is operating within the realm of integrity. Integrity. Uh, you ever work for a boss that just didn't have a whole lot of integrity? Well, it's a frustrating situation, isn't it? Uh, you, ever, uh, uh, you ever been mistreated by a police officer? Or you ever been mishandled by a government official or a government organization? You ever been unfairly audited by, say, the IRS and they were coming after you? And uh, I hope that's not happened to anybody here. It's never happened to me. And, and uh, be honest on your taxes, amen? That way you don't have to worry about that stuff. But wisdom, justice, I wrote down uh, uh, next to judgment. Judgment. You say justice and judgment, aren't they the same thing? Well, not really. Justice is more the people that represent the judgments. Judgment is an action. Justice is a noun. Judgment, I wrote down the words scrutiny, findings, conclusion. Scrutiny, findings, conclusion. Uh, it's someone who is good at judgment, they are very good at scrutinizing or studying out the details of a situation and not jumping to conclusions too soon. Let me give you a piece of marital advice to the men here. When your wife is explaining a problem to you, listen to the whole thing. Don't jump to conclusions. Listen to everything she has to say. And then when she's done, sit there for a minute and think about it. And then once you know exactly what you want to say and you're going to say, open your mouth and share with her you understand how she feels before you tell her what she should do. What is that? That's being scrutinizing. Now we hear the word scrutiny and we think negative. But listen, uh, someone who is uh, doing judgment, they're scrutinizing a situation. They're observing every detail. They're getting to the bottom of whatever it is so they can understand it. Findings, it's all the discovery. It's, it's compiling all the evidence before you jump to, and then that third word was uh, conclusions. And then the last word I wrote down here, or rather the last word in verse 3 is the word equity. Equity, and I wrote down two words next to that, duty and fairness. Duty and fairness. What, 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 uh, backing away from these four words, what do we get from this? It says they're to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity. Listen, uh, you're never, ever, ever, ever going to arrive. You can always do better. You can always be better. What should we be trying to do? We should constantly be looking at wisdom and justice and judgment and equity and perfecting ourselves over and over and over again. Let her see, notice, pass along subtly. Pass along subtly. We'll hit this one quickly. Now look at verse 4 there. And, and again, we're looking at purposes of the book of Proverbs, why the book was given to us. It says there in verse 4, to give subtlety to the simple to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Now we're going to look at uh, uh, we're going to look at that simple in a minute. But that idea of subtly as uh, a leader is that you're giving to them the ability to uh, to to accurately wield themselves through life in a very very careful way. When I think of subtlety. You know, we were talking about metamorphosis all day Sunday. You, you remember that if you were here and you were awake, amen? Uh, metamorphosis, and, and when I asked you what the visual illustration that you thought of when you thought of the word metamorphosis, you said what? Butterfly. You know, you know what animal I think of when I hear the word subtle? I think of a snake, a serpent. I think of the Garden of Eden. I think of how subtle Satan was in getting Adam and Eve to, to, to be tripped up. You know what you're supposed to teach the simple ones, you're supposed to teach them the same subtlety that Satan used. Now, you're not supposed to teach them to be deceiving. There's a difference between being deceptive and being subtle, being subtle. Um, you say, Pastor, can you back that up with Scripture? I can. Christ told his disciples that they were to be as wise as serpents. Remember that? Matthew 10, 16, Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Listen, it's a, it's a very difficult world for a child, for an adult for that matter, but especially for a child to navigate through. 
And if they're not taught subtly to learn how to deal with difficult situations that they're going to be put in in their neighborhood around friends and at school and, and even here at church and in a, back, in a corner conversation that they could get themselves into. They need to know that subtlety. They need to learn that subtlety. Letter D, write down this, practice astutely. Practice astutely. And uh, look with me at verse 5 and verse 6 of Proverbs 1 there. Again, we're looking at the purposes of why we were given the book. It says there, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Now, there's that infinitive to, okay? Infinitive to. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, listen, I've heard all kinds of weird theories about that dark sayings thrown out. I've heard that, uh, that Solomon, <laughs> this is probably the most bizarre, but Solomon didn't just write a book of, of good deeds. He wrote a, a sorcery book as well to go around. Go along. And to me, that's crazy talk. I don't know where they get all that. And, and they, they extrapolate that out of dark sayings. I looked that word dark up today uh, to see what that meant, or, or rather in my study. And, and the word dark, all it means is riddles. That's it, riddles. You find yourself in life, Facing some riddles. You ever had someone throw a really tough riddle at you? And you think and you think and you think about it and you can't figure it out? Well, listen, when it's trivial, it doesn't matter. You can just say, okay, well, tell me. But sometimes you're stuck inside of a life riddle. And you need to figure it out to get through life. And all Solomon was saying here is that by understanding these proverbs, these heavenly proverbs, they will get you through life's riddles. That's all that means. Practice astutely. And I chose the word astutely on purpose. That word uh, 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 or with, great, uh, with, with, with great meaning, that, that, uh, that word astutely. And it carries the idea of studying in great detail. How many of you here have ever taught school? Would you raise your hand if you've ever taught school? My hand's up. You get those students. I taught seventh grade math for two years. And you get those students that do the function of the formula because you told them to do the function of the formula. And they usually make a C minus or lower on tests. But then you have those students, they need to know the why behind the formula. Right? Look, I can get up here week after week after week and I can preach and teach and preach and teach and preach and teach and you can go, oh, okay. I guess I need to do that because the preacher said that. You know, what I, you know what I want you to get to and be? I want you to be that student in the classroom that says, Pastor, it's not just enough for me to hear you say it. I need to get in the Word of God and study it. I don't just need you to give me wisdom from the pulpit. I need to understand the science of the wisdom beneath it. Isn't that why Paul praised the church of Berea? Because they studied the Scriptures daily. And so let, let, let that be us. Let's practice, practice astutely. Number three, we'll look at the people of Proverbs. The people of Proverbs. Someone uh, uh, uncovered my eyes to this. Uh, I guess I was a college student when I saw this. And, um, and it, it has changed the way I have read the book of Proverbs the many, many times I've read it since. There are five characters inside the book of Proverbs. There are five different types of people inside the book of Proverbs, and they all interact with each other in life today. Let me just, uh, let, me, let me fire them off to you here in A, B, C, D, and E. We'll come back and look at some scripture verses, go along with them. Letter A is the simple one, the simple one. Letter B is the prudent guide. Those that go to my Sunday school class, you probably filled in the blanks already. Letter B is the prudent guide. Letter C is the scorner. The scorner, letter D is the wise, letter E is the fool. Those are the five characters you find in the book of Proverbs. Now, let's get our bearings about uh, what each one is, all right? You got all those filled in? Simple one, uh, 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 let's see, prudent guide, scorner, wise, and fool. Turn over with me to Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 7. And, and by the way, uh, I would really highly recommend that you get... Um, a concordance or you use a Bible app or you can search up words 
and read all the verses and do a study on what a simple one is in great detail. Do a, do a study on, on what a prudent guide is and who he's supposed to be. Do a, a study on what a scorner is. Uh, and then the same thing with the wise and the fool. And try to understand these so you can better understand how, who they are and how they interact. And I'm going to kind of uh, do some role playing with this here in a minute. Look at verse 7 of Proverbs 7. The Bible says, And behold, among the simple ones, I discern among the youths, a young man void of understanding. Now, in my Sunday school class, I think I took two, maybe three lessons just to cover what a simple one is. And I, obviously, we've got about 20 minutes of, of the Bible study tonight. I can't uh, cover it in 20 minutes, uh, spend the rest of the time in the 20 minutes with this. But let me just give you a couple of words to sum up the simple one, okay? Uh, curious, curious. You read the rest of Proverbs 7, what's the simple one doing? He's going the way to her street. He had no intention of sleeping with this girl. He just wanted to go down there and see what was going on. I think of, um, I think of a young man who, who doesn't want to go in the adult bookstore, but he wants to walk past it and look in the window. I think of a young man that doesn't want to drink a beer. He just wants to hold it in his hand and look at it. He wants to, he wants to touch it. I think of a young man who doesn't want to necessarily be addicted to cigarettes, but he wants to try just one. That's a simple one. They're curious. They have a curiosity with sin. The, the other word I'd give you to write down is the word clueless. They're clueless. You know what a simple one is? A simple one's that right there. They're a blank sheet of paper. You say, who are the simple? Everybody is born simple. We all are. Now, Mom, Dad, you need to get the heart of your child at a very small age so you get to be the one that writes on that blank piece of paper. And you have competition. We talked about the prudent guide. You are the prudent guides. You say, I don't have any kids. You're a prudent guide. You're a prudent guide. You got little kids running around your feet here at church. You have some influence on them, whether it's in a class, a, a, a conversation in the lobby, you are a prudent guide. You're a prudent guide. Some of you here teach school. Some of you here um, uh, interact with, uh, with master clubs that will be starting up here soon. You are prudent guides. You're prudent guides. Uh, let's look at a verse about prudent guides. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3. I love this verse. Um, um, and again, I'm pick, picking one verse for each of the five characters here. It says there in Proverbs 22, 3, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Now, we, 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 I preached a sermon a couple months back entitled The Keep Commandment. We looked at this verse. We talked about how that prudent man, he is foreseeing the evil. He's, he's that watchtower. Remember? He's looking out for the evil that's lurking in the distance. And he sees it long in advance. How many of you here have really, really good vision? Anybody here? Really, really good vision. I got an older crowd, so not that you're old, but the person next to you is. Amen. Um, you're, is that true, Lexton? Does Esmeralda have pretty good vision? Uh, I've been in cars with people, and you're looking for a street sign, and they can see it like, like a mile away. And it's like, I can't even see the green, and you're reading what's on the sign I can't even see. And I've got pretty good vision. When I was a kid, I had 2010. It's probably 2020 now. But uh, that's how you have to get as a prudent guide, where you can foresee the evil coming and you hide yourself. Or, and you hide your simple ones. You hide your simple ones. You've got to learn how to do that. Just because everyone else is letting their child watch that movie doesn't mean, Mom, you need to let your child watch that movie. Just because everyone else is taking their child down to the Mohegan Sun to see that presentation doesn't mean that you need to do that. You've got to have some prudence about you. Letter C, we talked about the scorner. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 7. And then we're going to look at verse 8 as well, talking about the wise. The, the scorner. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. Now, Notice the next half of this verse. And he that rebuketh the wicked man getteth himself a blot. Who is the scorner? Write down the word rebel. Write this down. Hates authority. 
hates authority. Now, a scorner will play authority to get his own authority so that he can undermine the authority. I'll give you an example. You'll see a scorner who is the cool kid at school, and he will jockey himself with the coach to be the team captain. So that in the, in the locker room when coach isn't there, he can tear down the coach. You'll see some kid who's voted class president so that he can make fun of the school administrator and principal and teachers. And the teacher will make the mistake of giving him that position, thinking he can win his heart. That scorner has got his mind made up. He hates authority and he hates all rules. That's a scorner, okay? Let, the next one there is the wise. Look down at verse 8, Proverbs 9, 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. What does a wise man do? He'll take rebuke from anybody. If a fool rebukes a wise man, and the wise man sees some truth in it, he takes it and makes a correction. It doesn't matter who, who it is. He sees it and he makes a correction. And that's key. Listen, you've got to look past the person critiquing you, and you've got to look at the critique. You've got to ask yourself, is it fair? Is, it, is there any truth to it? And if there is, you take care of it. That's a wise person. And then uh, letter E, we looked at uh, the full term of Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 9. And I don't have time to cover all this because I've got um, uh, one more uh, point I want to make and get to here. Proverbs 14, verse 9. And then uh, you can jot this down to, to look at later. Proverbs 13, 19, and 20. 13, 19, and 20. But 14, 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Fools are not as devious as scorners. Fools don't have a game plan. Fools aren't in intelligent enough to do that. Fools just, they just think, they, they, just, they just go about life living in their folly. What did, uh, 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 what did uh, Solomon say to his son? As a dog returneth to his vomit, so the fool returneth to his folly. They just, a fool just wallows around in their folly. They're not intelligent enough to try to trip anyone up on purpose. If they do, it's on accident. Now, I, I want to illustrate this for you guys. I did this in my class, but most of you aren't in my class. You ought to be, but you're not. Amen. I need uh, five, five people if they come up and help me real quick, volunteer. Just five people. Hop up here, and uh, that way we can quickly illustrate this. I can get five of you up here. Okay, John will have you stand here in the middle. Brother Barone, you can stand on that end. Jason, you can go on down there. Jamie, Jamie, you can stand here, and, and Jake, you can stand over here. Okay, so... In this illustration, come over toward the middle for me here. John's our simple one, and John is born facing this way. Okay? Jason represents the fool. Man, this is working out great. Um, <laughs> Jake represents the scorner. Jamie represents the prudent guide. Brother Verone represents the wise man. Now, why is he born facing this direction? Because he has a sin nature. And he's curious about what's down there. He wants to know. And so the scorner has a lot easier job getting him to be a fool than the prudent guide does getting him to be wise. Because, because his heart's already bent that way. You've got to work extra hard to get this guy this direction because he's got a heart in here that's yanking him that way, magnetized that direction. This one here, the prudent guide and the scorner are direct enemies. This guy here can't stand her. And truthfully, once she sees his tactics, she doesn't care for him either. Now, she's going to pray for him, but she doesn't like him, especially when he's going after her son. How do you like having Jamie as a mom? <laughs> Down on that end, Jason's just living, just living in his folly, and on that end, you know, Jay, Jay over there, but Jay, he's just living in, in wisdom, living in the land of wisdom. And let me just quickly say this. I haven't said this in class at all. We have too many people that are living over here in wisdom, but they're not actively being prudent guides trying to grab the heart of the simple and get them over there. Don't just be selfish and keep your wisdom to yourself. you got to work to try to get people this direction. you got to invest in this next generation, or they're all going to end up over there. So you got you got the scorner here yanking on the simple one, and you got the prudent guide working. Now, most scorners, let me just tell you what I've seen. Most scorners are more subtle and crafty than most prudent guides are. 
Most prudent guides are what that verse says in the Bible. It says, let not your good be evil spoken of. When they're losing the heart to the scorner, instead of, instead of investing more time and more energy and more love, all they do is stand over here and they yell and they holler and they put down. And all you're doing is shoving them further and further this way. You can't do that. Listen, this isn't your enemy. This is your enemy. you got to get hold of this guy's heart. And you got to slowly and carefully walk him back. Walk him back. The more you're losing the heart of the simple one, the more it's time to invest. Take a week off of work and go somewhere. Show some deep, deep, deep love. And pray very, very hard. You, got, you all can be seated. And that's just a really quick snapshot of that, of that concept. But those are the five characters in Proverbs. And as you read over that, consider that. Uh, and, and, and pray. Some of you here are prudent guides. Be prudent in your guiding. Don't, uh, don't be slothful in that. Take that serious. And that plays right into uh, point number four, the passions of Solomon. The passions of Solomon. Solomon was a very, very, very passionate man. And i got to say, uh, before we get into the subpoints here, i got A, B, and C for you. Rehoboam's going to have a lot of answering to do in heaven someday. No dad has ever put together a book filled with more wisdom than Solomon did for his son. And I don't think that Solomon just wrote a book and left it at that. Listen, I think Solomon was active in Rehoboam's life. I think Solomon tried very hard. I quoted that verse a few minutes ago as a dog returneth to its vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Here's how I see that verse coming about. I see Solomon standing in the hallway with his son as the dog is puking up its lunch. And Solomon's standing there with Rehoboam and he says, hey, you see how the dog came back there and ate that? That's what a fool does with his folly. He used a lot of similes. He used a lot of visuals to try to get through to his son Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, after his dad died, acted the biggest fool that he could have acted. Could have acted. And, and, I, and I, we're not going to get into all the psychology as to why, but just acted the fool. He, he went, his dad worked hard to get him to the land of wisdom, and he just went the complete opposite direction. He went over there to the land of foolishness. What was Solomon passionate about? Letter A, he was passionate about his son. His son. And, and to this, the, the application is going to be to your children. Now, the title of the Bible study tonight is Getting and Giving Wisdom. It's getting and giving it. It's not just enough to absorb it in. you got to get good at giving it out. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Turn over there with me if you would. We're going to look at several verses. We'll start left in the book and work, work our way right. And if I, if I could go till 9 o'clock, we could look at many more. But uh, you all are tired and got to get home and get to bed. you got work tomorrow. Verse 8 says there, my son, hear, my son, that's what I want you to see. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Look down at verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law. 21 times. 21 times in 29 chapters, hey, he says to uh, Rehoboam, my son, my son, my son. Solomon was passionate about his children. You know, I, I look around our country today, and what I see are broken homes. Lots and lots of broken homes. You say, oh yeah, Pastor, I, I know that uh, down in the projects, you know, dads, they, they, they're, uh, they're running around and, and just, uh, they got children, two or three women, and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, delinquent dads, they're, they're, they're just not there. I'm not seeing it only in the projects, I'm seeing it in church houses. I'm seeing it at homes where dad lives under the same roof, but dad's not really investing in the child. And look, if your children have gone wayward tonight, I'm not here to throw... Yeah, I, I'm not here to, to throw rocks at you. Uh, my children are still small. I may end up where you are. That, that very well could happen. Again, Solomon invested in Rehoboam, and Rehoboam still went wayward. And that happens sometimes. That happens sometimes. But I am here to say is what we need are men 
who don't just come home from work tired. They come home and they invest in their families. Letter B, I see wisdom. Wisdom. Now, before we jump into wisdom here, before we jump into wisdom, let me just quickly say this, is that you're going to, you're going to go out and get a drink of water and you're going to come back and you're going to be 80 and your children are going to be 50 and 60. It happens like that. And if you're not going to invest in them, somebody's going to invest in them. You're not going to write on that blank page of their heart. Somebody's going to. Well, you got to do that and you got to do it during the 18 years that you're stewarding their life. Wisdom. Now, uh, this is a really fascinating study. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 4 with me. As I was putting this together, I felt like the Lord really gave me something extra special here in, in studying. While you're turning there, the word wise and the word wisdom in this short book of the Bible appear more than 125 times. You find the words wise and wisdom 125 times. Now look at chapter 4 verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law, uh, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, he said unto me, let thine heart uh, retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Now, um, I, I have in my Bible the word her marked, forsake her not. And she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. Shall she deliver to thee. Now, uh, I, you know, I've obviously been reading the book of Proverbs most of my whole life, all of my reading life. And um, I never really stopped to think why God related wisdom to a female it's a very interesting thought he relates wisdom to a woman what are the parallels between a godly woman and wisdom well i i wrote down a few here and uh, some of these i'll extrapolate out of the text. others others uh, uh, just make good common sense and if you've got a place maybe get a blank piece of paper write some of these down and and maybe think about this deeper and, and, and come up with some of your own. But I wrote this down. Both are valuable. Both are valuable. Um, if you've done any marital counseling with me uh, or premarital counseling with me, you've heard this illustration. And so if you have, bear with me. I may have even used it from a pulpit. But I've been your pastor for a year now, so I get to start using illustrations a second time. Amen. You knew it was going to happen eventually. Um, men are like a plastic cup from 7-Eleven. They're like a 7-Eleven tumbler. You, you can just kind of throw them around emotionally and they just get right back up. You, you ever see two boys, they're, they're at recess in school, they're throwing fists at each other and by the end of the day they're back to being best friends, right? Doesn't work that way with girls. No, 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 no. Girls get into a fight and they don't talk to each other for a month, right? Um, or longer. Those are, your, those are your daughters, John. Now, um, women, are not, women are not a plastic juggler from 7-Eleven. Women are a crystal base. What happens if you chuck a, a, a plastic cup on the ground? Nothing. What happens if you throw a crystal vase on the ground? You shatter it. Now, keep that in mind when you think of the verse in 1 Peter 3 that says that women are the weaker vessel. They're the weaker vessel. What's weaker, a crystal vase or a plastic cup? A crystal vase. Which would you rather have sitting in the china cabinet of your home? Not the 7-Eleven cup that's been ran through the dishwasher a hundred times and has the, the red uh, paint chipping, right? Um, wisdom's valuable. Just like a woman is. Valuable, valued. I wrote this down, both are fragile. Both are fragile. And it says there, it says there, uh, I believe it's verse 6. I'm looking back up. No, verse, um, oh no, I just wrote this down from 1 Peter 3. Giving honor unto the woman, which is the weaker vessel. Uh, wisdom, wisdom can be fragile, 
in that, that if you're not walking with the Lord, you lose it quickly. You lose it quickly. Let me give you a couple others really quick, run through these. Both are mysterious. Both are mysterious. Um, I've been married to my wife now 10 years. And there are times, in fact, most mornings that I'm not in a rush, I will roll over and I will look at my wife who's usually still asleep. And I am blown away at how she can be that beautiful. Just, I get to talk a little extra about her tonight. She's not here, amen. I think she's watching on, on YouTube there. Hello. You can get me later. Um, both, and, and I'm just blown away by that. There's a mystique to her. There's a mystery to her. I'll, um, I'll watch the way that uh, she walks like a woman. And I'm blown away at how God created that, that, that woman to be that pretty and that special. And, and I look at wisdom and godly wisdom that comes from above. And I am blown away every time God gives me some portion of it to help to use for other people. I have mentioned in here before how that... Uh, I'll be out soul winning or I'll be helping someone in a counseling office and something will just blop, just pop out of my mouth and I go, wow, that was pretty good. I've never even thought that before. You know what that is? That's God's wisdom being conveyed out of my mouth. That's mysterious. It's mysterious. I wrote this down. Women and a godly woman and, and wisdom both seek loyalty. Both seek loyalty. Look with me at verse 6. Of Proverbs 4 there. It says, Forsake her not, speaking of wisdom, and she shall preserve thee. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. I think of that verse that says, It's better to dwell in the corner of a rooftop than with a, in a white house with a brawling woman. And you want the woman to know that you're loyal to her, right? Uh, when you're loyal to your spouse, you're loyal to your spouse, what do you have? You have a woman who is very loyal to you. I'm talking about a godly woman. And loyalty is the same way. It says, forsake her not. Don't push her away. Don't, don't, don't substitute God's wisdom for the fake, uh, 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 the fake counterfeit of earthly wisdom or man's knowledge. Don't substitute that in there. If you'll be loyal to God's wisdom, what will it do? It will preserve you. I wrote this down about the parallels between the two. Both are fueled by love. Both are fueled by love. Look back at verse 6. Uh, Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Look at this. Love her, and she shall preserve thee. Love her. As, uh, as I have uh, been married to my wife for 10 years, I can tell you I love her a whole lot more now than I did when I got married. Now, on my wedding day, uh, when I walked up to Angela, if you would have walked up to me and said, uh, do you love Angela as much as you can? I would have said, Yes. I can't love her any more than I do right now. Ten years later, ten years later, I love her way more than I did back then. Some of you here have been married 30, 40, 50 years. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Wisdom's the same way. The more you learn to love wisdom, the more wisdom will preserve you. I gotta say that with my wife, the deeper I love her, the better she preserves me as a man. She's that help me to me. She's that young lady, that woman that comes alongside of me and completes me. And the better job I do loving her, the better, easier it is for her to complete me. The more you love wisdom, the more you value it, the more you ask God for it, the more you depend on it, the better it will preserve you. I wrote this down as well. Both need to be cherished. Both need to be cherished. Look at verse 8. Oh, this is so good. Exalt her, exalt her, cherish her, exalt her. And she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. When thou dost embrace her. You, you, uh, uh, you take a woman and you promote her in your heart and in your life. And you do the little things that show her that you care for her and you love her and she's important to you. The Bible talks about in Ephesians 5 the parallels between Christ and the church and the husband and his wife. And it says there that we are to cherish and nourish our wives as a man does his own body. And I don't know a man that doesn't take good care of his body. 
I take good care of this body. Amen. Uh, I don't know any men that don't take good care of their body. I, Brother John over there, I know how much he loves sweets. And, and, uh, and, and you probably get that because you've got a sweet wife. And so you just can't get enough. Amen. But uh, you've you got you to gotta cherish wisdom. You've got to exalt it in your life. You've got to make a big deal of it. And, and then what you get is when you embrace it is that uh, she, she, wisdom, what does she do? She promotes you. She promotes you. The last one I wrote down here, she reciprocates love by giving back respect. She re reciprocates love by giving back respect. Look at verse 9 of, of Proverbs 4. She will give to thine head... An ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. I don't know if I have enough time to really, really draw this thought together. But in marriage, a man's job is to love his wife. A woman's job is to respect her husband. Ladies, your husband does not want to be loved by you. He wants to be respected by you. Now, that love is involved in that. But uh, he is to love you. You're to respect him. And when you love wisdom, wisdom turns around and respects you back. It says that she'll give thine head an ornament of grace. She'll, a crown of glory uh, she shall deliver to thee. And so she reciprocates love by giving back respect. As you give a, a wisdom love, a wisdom turns around and gives you uh, respect or gives you that place of respect. Let her see, write down guidance, guidance. Rattle these off real quick. Proverbs 1 8, my son, hear the instruction. Verse 10, my son, consent thou not. Verse 15, my son, walk not in the way. Chapter 2, verse 1, my son, receive my words. Chapter 3, verse 1, my son, keep my commandments. What was he doing? He was providing guidance to his son. I made this statement a few minutes ago, but your children are going to find guidance from somewhere. The generation behind us is going to get its guidance from somewhere. It's either going to be you, or it's going to be that world out there. There's a commercial I saw on TV some time back. This boy walks up to his cell phone, and he asks Siri how to shave. How many of you seen this? Anybody? Am I the only one? He asks, it may have been a YouTube thing, but he asks Siri, how do I, he was a 15-year-old boy, how do I shave? And the voice came through, and uh, it was a setup on the back end where it was the dad answering the question through Siri's voice. And the dad walked out and said, son, don't ever ask technology a question that I can answer. You come to me. Listen, uh, our kids have so much access to technology that if we're not careful, they'll run to let Google tell them how to live life. They'll run to their friends. They'll run to secular school teachers uh, that are godless. They'll run to Hollywood. They'll run to the music industry. And they, they let these influences that are not spiritual, uh, uh, godly people influence them and give them that guidance and then what we have is we end up with a generation of kids who want nothing to do with mom and dad's morals and values anymore and i'm here today to say parents listen be that prudent guide get that blank paper of their life grab their heart through careful uh, uh, uh chastening and correction and then and then write down what you want them to have on their heart it's so important get wisdom for yourself but don't hog it. Share it. Give it to that generation behind us. By and large, I'm sitting here tonight, and there's 30, 40, 50 of us in here. There might be 80 people in the building. How many people are not here that should be? If, if this church was here 150 years ago, how many more people would be here tonight based on the moral and value system of the way the society was then compared to now? We're going the wrong direction, folks we got to step up. we got to be more crafty. we got to be more subtle on how we're getting that wisdom into their hearts so they love the Lord. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight. Question one, are you getting wisdom? If you are, great. If not, go get it. James 1.5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. You pray, you ask him for it. You, you study the books in the Bible that contain it. All the Bible contains wisdom, but it's really concentrated in some places. If you're getting it, let me ask you another question. Are you giving it? 
Say, oh, my kids are grown. Then find someone, to, so, find more kids in this church and invest in them. Give it. Give it. You got to give it. You got to give it. Lord, help us tonight to be people that get wisdom and then give wisdom, that invest strongly in this next generation. And God, if we can get hold of this concept, we can get good at it, Lord, we can salvage this, this country. We can hand this country to our children and grandchildren, and, and Lord, it can still be somewhat a God-fearing place. Help us with this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The piano begin to play. We'll open the altar. If you want to come and kneel and pray just for a, a moment or two and ask God to help you with this, I'd encourage you. Be that prudent guide. Be that prudent guide. Don't be a foolish guide. Don't be a scorner. Don't be a fool. Some of you are wise. You're living over here in the land of wisdom, but you're not really playing the role of prudent guide enough. I encourage you to do that. Let's sing that chorus together, could we? Here we go. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my life, Lord, be glorified today. Amen. Thank you for being here this evening. Hope the Bible study was an encouragement to you. Jump in the book of Proverbs and read it every day. There's 31 chapters. There's Most months, there's 31 days. Read the, the, the day that corresponds with the chapter and, and let the Word of God uh, uh, teach you and study you. I know when you get into a book like that, there's so much. It's like, it's like buying a bottle of concentrate soap. You have to take the time to really dilute it out so you can get some things out of it. But study it. Don't get to where you're just glazing over verses. Really stop and study it and you'll... You'll, uh, you'll get a lot from it that will make you better. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight. I pray you have a good rest of your weeks with your, your work, your various places of employment, and be a bright light in a dark world. Amen. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer as we go. Brother Jay Colley, if you would, close us in prayer.